So, um, for those of you watching, thanks for joining. Um, episode 40, 40, 40 weeks in a row. And we're, as always, uh, thankful that our guest has given up their, their free time, uh, their time for free. Um, Rich Willey, ass assistant professor at, I said earlier in one of the comments, East Carolina University, but it's actually the University of Montana, so I apologize. Oh, that that's right. fine. Um, Anyone who's got questions for Rich as we're going along, fire away. I, mean, I don't know that an hour is going to be long enough because when we look into your back catalogue, your research gate profile, your publication CV, there's just so much stuff to talk oh. about. It's so much interesting stuff, you know, that we'll try and kind of get through it as best we can. Um, we thought we'd start with uh, a little plug for you as well, because I know you're coming to, to my hometown of London next week, um, <laughs> I am, yes. <laughs> to, to do a course and to have a burger with Brad and myself. And um, oh, Craig's just putting it up now. Um, and the topic there is, is restoring load capacity in the injured runner. And uh, we thought that was a pretty good place to start would be without kind of giving the game away on that, on that uh, course and, covering it in, in the entirety, just talking a bit about what load capacity was for those um, people listening who perhaps are not as familiar with it as, as they could be. And, and then off the back of that, we'll, we'll go into sort of more running related and gait related things. Um, if that's okay, yeah, do, would you mind starting there, Rich? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, well, first off, uh, Craig and Ian, thanks so much for, for having me on and for everybody who's joining. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in. And um, but yeah, load capacity, what is that? I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, it's easy to kind of get a little bit caught up in what causes running injuries. And, um, you know, I think we, a lot of times, a lot of attention is placed on running shoes and, and, and so forth. But I think the reality of it is, is that a runner is doing more training load or more mileage or running volume, what have you, than what their, what their tissues are really able to tolerate. Um, so like what is training load like, or, um, or tissue capacity? Like how can you, how can you quantify that? Yeah, I think that that's, I think maybe the easiest way to do it is if, if a runner gets injured uh, or they're having a decline in performance, that means they're probably exceeding their, their tissue capacity. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways to kind of, kind of look at this and maybe I'll, I'll pull up a slide here since, uh, we have that, we have that capability, but, um, I think I'm going to go over here. Um, so I'll get this, I'll do this correctly. There we go. All right. So, um, like when we look at, um, I'll kind of get this is a little schematic here and this is you know on the on the x-axis we have training load so how much training someone's doing and you know what what that means I think a lot can be kind of considered to be training load so that can be you know how fast one somebody's running uh, how many how many days per week they're running uh, what their training load is per session so what their overall distance is uh, running surfaces and so forth and on the y-axis would be their risk of injury so as you can see the further you go to the right the higher your training load um, the greater your risk of injury but the really interesting thing that also happens is that you kind of this nice u-shaped dose response that if your training load is relatively low you also have a higher risk of injury, but let me kind of walk you through this a little bit. And um, basically, this this U-shaped curve kind of changes um, based on where someone is uh, in their overall running training or whatever whatever other sport that they might be doing. Um, but when you're in this kind of this, when you're just kind of training, like what's normal training for you, you're kind of in this position of homeostasis where you're you're applying enough load to yourself to kind of maintain your structure and your overall tissue capacity um, but probably not enough necessarily to get stronger or, or be able to tolerate greater training loads um, where a lot of runners get themselves in trouble is when they do too much and they they really exceed what they're used to doing and that's when they kind of get into this tissue overload region um, the flip side of this would be what we call stress shielded so this would be someone who maybe perhaps gets an injury and then what they then do is that instead of doing some sort of rehab or something like that they totally rest and then they totally take a lot of time off or or something like that and then what happens then is that um, their tissue adapts to that lower training volume and then they're not quite as capable of tolerating some of the higher training loads that they were doing previously 
Um, the other example of this would be a runner who is running pretty consistently, who's, who's uninjured, and maybe for whatever reason, maybe they have a, you know, they've got some traveling that they're doing or so forth, uh, and their training volume drops for a couple weeks, and then they uh, jump right back into their training program. Um, they've kind of been in this stress shielded area where it's, it's, it's relative stress shielding, so they've, they've kind of undertrained themselves. Um, but for us as, as clinicians, where we kind of hang out a lot of times when we see patients who are injured is in this, in this adaptive homeostasis region. It's just a little bit more than what the individual is used to doing, and uh, this is kind of where we're going to see most of the benefits from rehabilitation, but also any sort of um, like running training program or something like that is getting ready, somebody ready for a marathon or some other type of race. Um, but this, this is kind of where we spend most of our time and where we want to be. And I think as clinicians, I think that um, I think this is a really delicate balance to kind of maintain. And, and a lot of times clinicians sometimes maybe are spend probably in my opinion, a little bit too much time in the stress shielded area. And, and I, I think that most, um, you know, most clinicians probably don't load their patients quite enough um, because when we do overload them too much, it, it's easy because it's easy to tell because they're getting a flare up uh, or something along those lines. So, yes, I mean, I think that when you look at like, tissue capacity, it's, it's really hard to like, you know, really quantify that um, with the exception of the, the easiest way to quantify it is if you get a running injury, then, then you've exceeded your, your tissue capacity. Um, but uh, if you're under training, it's, it's much, much harder to detect that for sure. <coughs> Thanks, Richard. Actually, just, just on that, Richard, there's probably 20 plus studies now on genetic risk factors for Achilles tendinopathy. Sure. And why you can only speculate the mechanism, I would speculate that probably a mechanism for that, for that genetic is the, just the tissue capacity issues uh, genetic. Um, yeah, 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 uh, precisely. And I think there's some other ways to look at it too besides genetics because, yeah, genetics certainly plays a role too. But I think too that one of the things that I, I think will come out uh, as more and more studies come out looking at tendon, for instance, is, um, you know, not just what is your kind of chronic training load that you're doing right now, but also the chronic training load that you've been exposed to throughout your entire life. And, and you know, a really good place for that, let me see if I've got this slide here, um, is when we're when we're young. And so if you're, if you're an adolescent in that kind of 12 year old to, you know, 17, 18 year old region, that, that's such a really important time um, to be loading um, your connective tissues and joints and so forth. And I mean, this is a little bit of a, there's a lot going on here in the slide, but you know, the main thing here is that I think this looking at this, this is looking at tendon, but this cross-sectional area, hopefully you guys can see my cursor. Um, but when you look at cross-sectional area here, you can see that as in tendon, then we start loading tendon as an adolescent immature to mature, you know, you can see it's massive, you know, gain in cross section area. And you see this for a lot of other things, elastic modulus mm -hmm. and cross linking and all the really important tissue qualities that we really like to see. And, and surely genetics plays, plays a big role in that. Um, and, and when you do that in a really kind of well balanced manner and, and, and like a the adolescent athlete is, you know, participating in a lot of different sports and being very consistent um, in their, whatever, their athletic endeavors, if you will. Um, I, you know, I think that probably sets them up really well um, for a lifetime of, of probably a slightly lower risk of sustaining like a running related injury or some other type of overuse yeah. injury. Sure. Um, actually, did, did you see that? I'll just share my screen now, I'll just take yours away. I presume yeah, you, sure. you saw the study a couple of weeks ago, the Project Run 21. Um, yeah, I did. A couple of weeks ago, and then you know, this comment here, you know, runners covering less than 15 kilometers per week may sustain more running-related injuries than their counterparts, which, you know, which I thought well, kind of makes sense. But I think I just looking at social media, that actually surprised quite a few people. But based on the comment yeah, you yeah. made, yeah, it's... Yeah, I think, I think that's a really interesting study um I had a discussion about that study with helpful on uh, I, I guess one of the takes would be like so if you're only running 15 kilometers per week and let's say you add you know for whatever reason um you go on a pub run or something like that and ends up you know adding on three or four extra kilometers for that that very next week that actually represents a pretty large percent increase in your your training volume for that week um so the lower volume runner can't get away with 
as much impulsive training as someone who is maybe training with a, you know, with a higher training volume. So if you're, instead of a 15 kilometer per week runner, you're a 50 kilometer per week runner, your margin for error is much, is much greater in the higher volume runner. Um, and, you know, so I, so I think there's that, but I think also there's probably um, a little bit of survival bias there too. True. So if you're a higher mileage runner, you know, you're probably, uh, there's probably, you've made it there for a reason. And that's because, well, maybe you've, you've done it in the right way uh, as far as slowly building your, your running volume up. Yeah, no, that makes sure. sense, yeah. I think your point about um, high loads, low loads is, is one that everyone should get, you know, be, be really familiar with. And across various social media platforms and presentations, you hear different uh, analogies of this, like the, the Goldilocks effect, you know, too hot, too cold, just right, or you hear the sort of yep. the bucket and the water analogy for the load and capacity. And as long as you, you know, as long as your capacity always exceeds your load, you'll be okay. Um, the stuff we're going to come on to talk about, it'd be great. I mean, like you say, it's easy with the injured runner. You know they've exceeded their capacity because they're injured. Yeah, right. Um, the challenge, the, you know, and then uh, the, I guess the, the, the challenge there is why have they exceeded their capacity? You know, was it too much love capacity? Was it, was it, then we start looking at their mechanical things. So when we talk about some of the things we come on to, footwear, gait mm -hmm. analysis, um, I'm going to try and link it back into this capacity thing if I, if I can. If I forget, then remind me that that's what I, what I was intending to do as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. Um, can we I mean, talk about the you know, if, if I can just add too, I mean that that tissue capacity is is tissue specific too. So when you when you think about tissues, you know, muscle is super adaptable, and I um, mean all you have to do is spend a spend a day or two binge watching something on the couch, and you know that you're going to lose some muscular strength very very quickly. Uh, also, if you the flip side of that would be if you go to the weight room. Um, and you haven't been in the weight room for a little bit, and you um, put a little bit of time into the weight room, you, you see strength gains very, very quickly. Um, the problem that we run into is that other tissues, tendon particularly, um, it doesn't respond as quick. And so, you know, Jill Cook, a researcher from, from Melbourne, down at La Trobe University, I think she's very fond of saying that you have a very smart, very smart muscle attached to a very dumb tendon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really like that because the muscle adapts so fast and, and tendon lags really far behind. So, um, you know, cartilage uh, adapts very slowly too, um, bone also. And so, so I think that, you know, I think when we talk about tissue capacity, you have to also think about what, what structure we're, we're talking about as well. Mm. Can we really quickly touch on the the uninjured runner? Yeah, sure. Uh, we don't see many. We, we don't see many of them clinically, of course, but because yeah. um, most people are coming into us with pain, and like we say, we see an injured runner. We know they've exceeded their capacity because because they're injured. Every now and then, a, 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 one of those annoying uninjured runners comes in and asks for a screening, <laughs> and sort of says, right. "Tell me, am I am I in the right shoe? What do you think of my technique? How how do we?" How do we gauge, or can we gauge their capacity? How do we know where they are on, on, on that graph? Yeah, that, I mean, that, yeah, I think that's such a good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think that the best way to look at it is if they use a GPS watch or something along those lines. So, you, you know, take a look at their chronic training volume to see what they're doing. And um, so I think that would, that would be one way, like, and, you know, some just from like a, what type of loads are they're being exposed to because we know if, like if you look at, at military studies and and so forth we know that the running or the training volume someone has done in the three months prior to say starting basic combat training or something like that seems to be very predictive of their risk of injury so people who have a, a, a lower training volume before they go into basic combat training tend to have a higher risk of having some sort of injury um, as far as tests that we can do in the clinic um, to say okay look we're going to go ahead and do a screen and see if you're you know higher risk for an injury and and so forth you know it seems like um, some of these screens that have had um, a lot of buzz behind them over the last couple or last decade or so like the functional movement screen or fms um, things like that seem to kind of fail spectacularly at, at predicting injury risk and and uh, tissue capacity and i think most of the research that i see like for instance on the, i want to pick on the fms a little bit is that the fms seems to be very very predictive of one's ability to do the fms you know so it's just it, so tests like that are not quite as good there, there seems to be some evidence that um you know, like uh, plantar flexor strength 
uh, is, is protective um, against some lower extremity injuries, particularly medial tibial stress syndrome. Uh, and I know also that uh, like Achilles tendinopathy and so forth. So medial tibial stress syndrome, for instance, uh, there is a paper, um, I don't quite remember the name of the author, but maybe came out four or five years ago. I found that, you know, those individuals that can do around 30 um, single leg calf raises full, throughout their full range of motion seem to have a lower risk of developing medial tibial stress syndrome, whereas those who, who did seem to be on the closer to around 22 or 23 uh, single leg heel raises. Um, so, but I mean, outside of that, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard thing to kind of quantify in the clinic. Um, and the other part of it too, is that there, there's a whole other aspect behind injury besides just tissue quality itself, but also, um, all the other the psychosocial things that go into why someone might get an injury. So things like, you know, their overall stress levels and, um, how much they're sleeping, um, you know, and so forth. Yeah. Good. I think if you can't predict runner that's going to get injured, then we, none of us should feel bad about not being injured. <laughs> Um, no. I, feel about, I, I feel better about myself you mentioned wearables we're going to touch on wearables if that's okay because i know yeah that'd be great many people list many people listening have probably read the the article that you wrote and it's been getting a bit of um bit of coverage on social media recently the pros and the cons i mean i would i would estimate around about 75 percent of the runners i see in london are wearing a garmin on their wrist for example um, uh -huh. So I mean, I, where, what, I, I guess yeah, yeah, yeah. Same actually, uh, even though I don't even run. Um, so, could you just kind of cover for us what where, what is a wearable? I mean, because I know you and I have spoken previously many months ago about things like Run Scribe. I guess would that come under the umbrella? What comes under the umbrella of a wearable? And could you kind of uh, sort of just summarise the pros and, and more importantly the potential cons of these things as well? Yeah, so, so what is a wearable? Uh, wearable is basically just some sort of device that, um, that quantifies your um, some sort of um, either movement pattern or physiological response. So heart rate, for instance, like one of the earliest wearables was actually a wireless heart rate monitor. Um, and I think the first one was commercially available uh, in the early 1980s. So that, you know, these things are not necessarily new devices, but there's been just an explosion and the amount of the, the availability of these devices. So GPS units, for instance, as you said, are kind of ubiquitous. I think most runners do have them. Um, how much they actually look at them or actually go back and look at their data is, is, is you know, with different matter. I think for me clinically, and I'm interested to hear what you guys say, but um, I, you know, I see everything from runners that come in that kind of see their GPS watch as kind of like a, like a G whiz kind of device. They, they look at it every once in a while and they just use it basically to quantify how much running distance they're doing to um, some of the higher level runners that I have come in here uh, to see us. Uh, they live and die by their, their Garmin GPS running watch and they'll spend a lot of time on looking over their data and even are involved in uh, like some social media platforms like Strava, for instance, which is kind of a, a social media, you know, repository where you can upload your, your running uh, GPS data or cycling GPS data um, and, you know, and so forth. Um, but so we have basically a bunch of different types of devices. We have the ones that can uh, quantify internal, uh, internal training loads. So that would be like the easiest one to describe would be just a, your standard wireless heart rate monitor. Uh, we have some other ones that will, um, can quantify external training load. Uh, and that would be things like, you know, how far you've run. So your GPS watch is kind of your, your typical example there. Um, some of the devices now are starting to come out with some ability to quantify certain running mechanics. And so like so a lot of the, the Garmin devices can quantify uh, GPS or sorry, uh, running cadence, stance time, how much your vertical oscillation. So how much you're bobbing up and down when, when you're running and so forth. And the other, the other companies do too, Sunto and, and, and Polar all have devices and there are a lot of smaller companies out there that, that do the same thing as well. Um, so those, there would be the, like those kinds of metrics. And now what we're starting to see are more um, advanced devices. They're going to they're starting to become more commercially available, and those would be devices like that use accelerometers that can measure like your impacts or your tibial shock or something like that. So it's an accelerometer or a sensor that you can strap to your tibia. Uh, or your lower leg and that basically can quantify the shock wave as it kind of propagates up your leg once your foot hits the ground. Um, so there are some really, you know, the, I think the devices, it's like 
you know, like, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, if you look back 20 years ago and compare with now, I mean, we have no shortage of information in our lives, whether it be like from the internet or from our, what we're wearing on our, on our arm or something like that, you know? So a lot of it is kind of like filtering out like what's going to be useful, what, what is like worth just ignoring. Um, and so I think that as clinicians, I think it's really important for if you're treating runners to really understand what these devices measure uh, and if there is criterion validity. In, in other words, how accurate is this device compared to the gold standard? Uh, and so you know, I think clinicians should be able to kind of come up with, okay, so what is the gold standard for measuring distance? You know, is it GPS or is it, you know, what have you? And, and you know, like obviously the best way to do it would be like a, a measuring wheel that you would use if you're kind of certifying a running course or, or something like that. But like GPS units, anybody who's ever spent a lot of time using one, even very high end ones, you'll, you'll notice that, um, for instance, there's a river who runs, that runs right through my town. When I run, sometimes I go back and look at my GPS data and it has me, the map has me running right down the middle of the river uh, in town, you know? So, so there's, these things are not really as accurate, I think, as we like to think that they are. And I, I think a good saying is all that glitters is not necessarily gold. And, um, and I think that really applies very well to a lot of these wearables. Um, we've spent a lot of time validating a lot of these devices uh, in our lab here. And if anybody's interested, they're always welcome to kind of reach out to me and send me an email and I can kind of tell you we don't, and it's worth saying that I don't have any um, conflicts of interest here. I don't accept devices from companies. I don't. I don't uh, have a contract with any companies or anything like that. But we bring these. We buy these devices and we quantify. We or validate them because we need to use them in our research studies. Uh, so if anybody wants, they can reach out to me and I, I can give you my fair assessment of of the device. But like vertical oscillation, for instance, is a really good metric to to talk about because um, it's it's not that hard to measure uh, with a with a uh, with a nice device. So, for instance, Polar, um, all right, Polar and um, Garmin have. Uh, basically it's a heart rate monitor strap that has a, an accelerometer that's embedded in it and that'll measure how much you're bobbing up and down um, and runners can sometimes get really tuned into that and 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 so forth but the unfortunate thing is that vertical oscillation hasn't been associated with any injuries whatsoever <laughs> and so um, and so runners sometimes will go out there and they'll try to really minimize how much they're oscillating up and down and they end up doing this kind of running style that we call Groucho running. And I don't know if you guys are, yeah. you, you know, remember Groucho Marx? Groucho yeah. running is like, you know, someone who's running with very bent knees and they're, they're you know, they're just like these easy gliders as they're moving along. And the, um, so a lot of times people to get really honed in on these uh, metrics and, and they do some, some funky things with their gait. And, and, you know, going back to Groucho running, when you do something like that, it really increases the metabolic cost of running um, and really for no good reason. For sure. Yeah. No, that, that, that's, that's a good point about those wearables giving data on things that have no relationship to running economy or running injury and then honing in on that. And you, I, I'm pretty sure you can recall the fuss four or five years ago about the 180 cadence and the obsession right. that some people got onto that, you know, in, in social media and arguing for it. I mean, but that's giving the wearables giving data on something that doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> No, yeah, that, that's a that's a great example, and we we have a lot of patients that come in to see us, and they're like, and, you know, they are they get really set on I got to keep my cadence at 180, mm -hmm. um, but when you go back and look at the data, and we we collect we quantify cadence, and every runner who comes into our lab just because it's one of the things that we automatically calculate, um, and what we find is the average runner is running about 174 steps per minute. Uh, or something like that, but that range is massive. It goes down to like 160 to the whole way up to almost 190 steps per minute. And so when you have a runner, I mean, I think one way to kind of flip it around um, is, you know, what about that runner who's running at 186 steps per minute for their cadence and they're suddenly read in runner's world or something like that, they should have their cadence at 180 and <laughs> they're going to slow down their turnover. I mean, I think it's, it's just a, it's a funny thing, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, Craig, I, I know you and I have kind of chatted about this and, and you know, I think you're the same school of thought is like, don't change your running gait unless, unless you have to. And even then, and even then there's going to probably going to be a bit of a price to pay for doing that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can accept the data on 
um, and say increasing the cadence five ten percent as part of a gate retraining to reload some tissues, but it's just that obsession that was going on about the one eighty, which was the yeah, yeah which was the. Um, so, Rich, what's the take home on wearables when you weigh up the pros and the cons? Should we? Should, I mean, runners are using them. Is that a good thing? And should clinicians be using them? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, so um, the group out of Denmark, uh, Rasmus Nielsen's group is a, an excellent running epidemiologist. Um, he, one of the, he came out of a really neat study a couple years ago and what they did, they compared, uh, run, they had runners, they gave them all GPS units and, but they weren't allowed to look at their running volume, their training volume or the mileage or whatever distance, whatever, whatever metric you're using. Um, but they, but then they also had them keep a training log separately. So they were blinded to their GPS data. And what they found was that runners would report their running volume with an error rate of about 36%. So, um, and the runners tended to overstate their running volume. So when I have a runner who comes into the, our lab and they, I ask them, well, what's your typical running volume or how many miles per week are you running? They'll, they'll tell me 45 miles per week and I know probably that's their aspirational running volume. <laughs> maybe, maybe they, maybe they hit that once in the last year. Um, and, and so that's, so that's why I think like, you know, lately what I've been doing is when people come in, I ask them if I can, you know, do you, do you mind if I take a look at your GPS data? And then I can really spend some time looking at their training volume there to see if I see some real fluctuations in their week to week, um, you know, their overall training distance and so forth. So I think they, they can be super, super useful for that. Um, I think also from like a running cadence standpoint, and we've published on this uh, several different studies now. Uh, one of the things when we have someone like a runner who comes in and, you know, as Craig mentioned, you know, that, you know, having a runner increase their cadence can be a really useful thing, particularly when they're trying to return from patellofemoral pain or they've had a tibial stress fracture in the past and, um, and, and so forth. Um, th those are really nice ways to reduce loading in the short term. But one of the things that we've found is that just telling a runner, just increase your cadence uh, is not enough. Um, and also it's not enough just to like to give them a metronome. So if you, there are different ways to kind of cue a runner to increase their cadence. So you can have them run with a metronome beat, um, which uh, personally would drive me crazy. And I think a lot of runners will probably tune that out after, after a while. Um, and the other part of it too is that runners are not, runners who have injuries, they're also for, there's, uh, and I'm not entirely sure why, but they have a really hard time detecting their errors. They have a really hard time figuring out if they're hitting their new cadence or not, if they're not receiving some sort of quantifiable feedback. And these running, these wearable devices um, that can give real-time feedback on running cadence it, you you know like you're right at 168 or 172 and most of these we've validated i think four or five of these devices now uh and running cadence is a pretty easy thing to to measure uh and most of these devices that are on the market are, are, are very accurate when it comes to running cadence so that's why we give like a running retraining program we say look you need to get yourself a device and um whether that be i need to show the runner how to actually see running cadence on their watch because a lot of them don't know how to change that display so it shows that to them or i tell them look here are some models that are worth considering and in the u.s you can get a, a device from garmin uh that will show you real-time running cadence for about it's about a hundred dollars and uh, first they're like oh it's so much money i'm like well you know i think this will really help you and how much how much like how expensive is that compared to getting another stress fracture you know and mm -hmm. and, and so forth so i think it's an easy sell but I think we also need, need to be very careful not to oversell these devices. Yeah, sounds good. Um, Actually, Rich, you made a really interesting comment just then. I just um, that look, going back and looking at the GPS data, you know, rather than just saying how many miles per week do you run and looking for those spikes, because you know, in the past, my typical running history was how many miles a week do you run? Write that down. You know, next question. You never really spent much time on it. And about 15 minutes ago, I'm not sure what we were talking about at the time, but Bruce Williams made this comment, wait, you mean we can't take what they tell us about their training volume at face value? <laughs> I, I just think there's just so much, you know, go, going back and looking at those spikes, looking at the, you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's kind of like, it's amazing what's changed in our history taking now compared to 
actually wasn't actually that many years ago. We just did focus on the miles per week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's obviously just one, like one part, one parameter of training yeah. volume. I mean, there's oh, yeah. intensity and all the different things. Um, and if I can just go back to that running volume point, um, a really nice study came out of Israel and they were uh, back in 2012. And I think this is probably the first study that used wearable devices to quantify uh, training load and runners and what they found, they, this was looking at individuals who would go on to develop stress fractures. And, um, you know, a, a lot of stress fractures uh, or runners who develop stress fractures, it's a, it's a, obviously a way more complicated injury than just, uh, you know, a stress fracture. I mean, there's a lot of psychosocial things that are going into this, um, the, this injury and the, the, the decisions this, this person is making, um, and you know, when are they going to go out for a run and how long are they going to run and, and impulsive training decisions, um, that might factor into what, what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But what that study found, and I, I think it's important to say this is that, uh, that, uh, that study found that runners who would go on to develop, uh, stress fractures, they quantify their running volume with a wearable device. <clears throat> they found that those individuals tended to underreport their running volume. Okay. Yeah. So, and they underreported it by quite a bit. I think it was 20 some percent. So it kind of goes both ways. And, and so I think that, um, and part of it wasn't that they were doing it on purpose. They just literally didn't realize that they were training that much more. Uh, and the other thing that they found too, was that when they became, because they also um, had them fill out a lot of, stress related questionnaires how much pressure are you feeling with your job how much pressure are you feeling from others to perform well they found that when that happens that tends to be a very big spike in the amount of training volume that those individuals are doing so you can you know you can see that when you see someone's look at someone's gps data you can say ask that person what was going on in your life during this time were you under a lot of stress or what, what happened? Or maybe you went on vacation and you decided to go on a big, you know, a lot of training runs or something like that. Um, I, I think that's, I think that data can be very helpful. Yeah, actually it's, it's really interesting. I, I tell the story quite regularly of uh, Robert De Costello, who's an Australian marathon runner. Oh, yeah. I think he had the world record at some time and he was interviewed a wee while ago on TV and asked, um, you know, why did he, why, why did he, why did he do so well? And he said he it was cause he was lazy. <laughs> and what he meant was he was one of the first, like back then it wasn't very professional, but back then he would literally do his training run. Then he'd go and lie on the couch for the rest of the day. And his competitors who trained as hard as he did had to go and work an eight hour day. So they had all these other stresses in their life that he yep. didn't have. And he put that down to his success was not that he trained harder. He was, he just rested more just had all it didn't have these other hassles in his life and it was a very interesting interview but that was his perception but that fits in quite nicely with what you're saying yeah no absolutely i, I think that that um you know i'm glad you mentioned that too because that brings up another point too is that i think that runners also when they're not running they're not doing they're not doing other stuff and runners do one thing they often will just go for a run and that's it and i mean they, they self-identify as a runner um so when they're injured they're probably not going to do really a whole lot else um so the other place where we use wearables is for that exact reason is that we know that a runner who's maybe has missed some training because of an injury, they probably haven't been doing a lot of other activities. And so we put it, we haven't used a, a step counter because we know that when someone, a runner starts a, like a return to run program on day one on just a, this is a one minute walk, I'm sorry, one minute run, three minute walk cycle or something like that for 30 minutes, the average runner is probably going to get about 4,000 foot strikes. Uh, during that during that first session and if they haven't built up to that by doing a walk program and building up their overall walking before they start that and maybe they're only getting in 4,000 steps in a day and then you add on that return to run program on top of that well congratulations you just doubled that runners uh, exposure to loading cycles or, or steps per day so I think that they, they can be very helpful in the return to run pro uh, program as well can we move on to talk about Gait analysis. Obviously, yeah. when we're seeing run, when, when we're seeing runners in in, uh, in the clinic in the lab, um, we'll, in the context of their injury and the, the history we take, and all the psychosocial factors and the and the you know the data that they're Garmin, you know, we're, we're, we're in our mind's eye, we're sort of thinking about the load capacity balance here, and obviously at some point, gait comes into the picture. Um, could you give us a bit of a brief insight into the kind of things 
you're looking for. And I'm guessing your lab is big and sexy and out. Most of us probably have a treadmill <laughs> on an iPad. So maybe, maybe what you look for and, and the kind of things that we as clinicians um, could or should be looking for. And if, if that's different, of, of course. Yeah. So we have, we have a really fancy three-dimensional motion analysis lab. We have a, um, we have a, you know, we have an instrument and treadmill, which is a way of saying that we have a treadmill that uh, measures your impact forces and uh, it does a lot of other nice stuff too. And, um, you know, it's a pretty, it's probably about a $200,000 lab, um, which is great for doing research. Um, but when we see patients clinically, we don't, I, I just use, I just run the treadmill as a regular treadmill. I don't, I don't do a three-dimensional motion analysis on people. Um, and, you know, again, going back to the wearable stuff, it's just too much data. It's too much data for, the, for me if I do a three-dimensional motion analysis on a patient for them, for me to go sit down and go over that, their, their findings with them. Uh, it's also too much data for me. So I just use a high-speed camera, and, which is a fancy way of saying my iPhone. <laughs> and um, so I use that and I, I use a, a free program called Canovia. Uh, and I like that because I can go through one frame at a time. And there are lots of other ones out there too that are free or you pay a very, very nominal fee for. Um, so what do I do? Like I haven't run on a treadmill. Um, you know, I look for a couple different, um, you know, it has to make sense with their running injury. And so uh, let's see, I'll think of some examples. So like patellofemoral pain in female runners, I know that um, a lot of female runners who have patellofemoral pain will often have kind of that, um, the, that hip adduction or that proximal mechanic coming from too much frontal plane motion at the hip. So that would be too much hip adduction and their pelvis is perhaps dropping or something along those lines. And in that case, a lot of times I'm looking for um, what we call a window, which is the bathing your two femoral condyles during mid stance. So like when your, your right leg or your left leg is going through the swing phase and your right leg's on the ground, if those two condyles are pretty close together, there's not a lot of daylight getting between there, that's typically a really good sign that that person has a lot of hip adduction. Um, so, you know, I mean, notice I'm not using numbers. I'm not saying this, well, that would equate to 20 degrees or something like that. Um, that's the other way that I do gait analysis too, is I do more of a, uh, kind of a qualitative gait analysis rather than, you know, quantifying numbers. So I don't, I don't digitize joint angles on patients and their 2D video and say, and have them come back a week later and say, oh, you know, you're three degrees better with your knee flexion or something like that, because that doesn't mean anything to the patient. And frankly, I don't know if that really means a lot to me either. Um, but for them, for me to say, all right, so you've got, your, you're coming in too much, your hips coming in too much, your thighs drifting in. We need to kind of work on trying to increase the distance between your knees when you're running. And I'm gonna show you some different ways that we can do that. That means something to that runner and it really resonates with them. Um, the other side of that too is I'm really very careful when I show a runner their gait, uh, their video, and that most of them have, and let's be honest, I don't know if I've ever seen myself running from behind in slow motion, you know? So, I mean, we don't, you know, that, that, that's not really how people really look, when, when, you know, and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm very, very careful to only point out the stuff that I absolutely think um, may be contributing to their injury, but more important are things that we can perhaps change. If you can't change it, I don't mention it at all, and we move on and, and uh, move on to something else. Actually, that, that last point's interesting because in quite a few of these episodes, we've talked about those concepts in pain science about nocebic language and stuff like that. So pointing some of those things out that can't be changed has the potential to, to have them focus on that um, rather than stuff that's actually is changeable and actually is relevant and can do something about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, if I look back five, six, seven, eight years ago, I mean, I definitely fell in the camp of saying, well, look, we, got, we need to change this, this, and that, and all that stuff. And, and, and now I've come to realize that, you know, I, I really have needed to move away from describing a runner's gait in that manner. And, uh, you know, also when I came out with my PhD, I was doing gait retraining on a lot of runners. But I would say now I probably change a runner's gait probably 20% of all patients that I see or, or maybe even less than that. Uh, and uh, it used to be, too, that I thought, like, you know, I mean, I look back at my dissertation work, we did some work with uh, female runners with patellofemoral pain, and they had that mechanic I just described where they had too much hip adduction. And, you know, we, we worked on doing some gait retraining on them to try to reduce how much that, that hip was, or their thigh was diving in, 
Uh, and we, and we, we saw them at the end of the eight sessions of gait retraining and they all reduced their hip adduction and it was great and their pain reduced and so forth. Then we did a one month follow-up and then a three month follow-up. And what we found was that at each follow-up visit, they drifted a little bit more and more back to where they were when they first came in to the study. And at the time I was like, Oh, this is awful. They're, they're drifting. They're, they need, they need a tune up. They need me to, you know, I need to tell them how to work on this again. Um, but then I started looking back at their pain data and I found that their pain data was not changing at all. They're still having a very high level of function. Um, their, their, their pain was very low, you know, remained low after the retrain sessions, uh, even three months out, even though they started kind of drifting back towards their old mechanics. So I think too, I think, I think it used to be, or at least I used to think that we had to make these gate mechanics permanent and there's changes in gate mechanics permanent. And, and now I, I think we just need to do it just until that runner can get over the hump and get their running volume back and build up that tissue tolerance to running. And then if they drift back to their old running mechanics, you know, it's no big deal. And um, they probably want to think about something other than when they're out for a run, other than their running cadence, they probably want to, I don't know, look at whatever scenery they're running past or something like that. And I think that that could be uh, very beneficial as well. Yeah, but that that last point is really interesting and obviously has implications for our interventions with foot orthoses for, you know, over pronation and over the long term as well. You know, get them over the hump, get the tissues to adapt. You know, they may or may not need them, you know. I mean, it's... Precisely. Um, yeah, yeah, right. So plantar fasciopathy, for instance. Mm. I mean, you know, uh, or patellofemoral pain is probably a, yeah. a better example. We know foot orthoses are super helpful for some individuals in mm. the first three months. Um, that doesn't mean they need to wear them the rest of their lives, but I, I use four orthoses all the time and, and patients have a telephemoral pain and just start weaning them out and they can move on. Yeah. You know, I recently spent an hour analyzing someone thought, uh, thought I'd really got through and, um, the email I received shortly after was thanks so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. Could you just clarify for me? Do I overpronate or underpronate? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh God! Um, so I think it's reasonable and, and, and completely logical. Uh, I'm reading between the lines here that your gait analysis will will vary depending on the, the person, the, the, the pathology, the, the the context. Is that is that uh, have I read between the lines appropriately there, Rich? Yeah, absolutely. Some people don't even get a gait analysis when they come in. Yeah. You know? so, so I mean, is there is there are there any things when you when you've got someone on the treadmill and you're looking at them running, regardless of context history pathology are there any things that you look at in everyone that you can think of i mean you mentioned cadence for for one uh, is there anything else yeah well uh i measure so i use a little foot pod um that transmits wirelessly to my garmin and i can stand there while they're running and it'll give me their running cadence on the treadmill so i write that down and i do that because that's often if there is going to be something i'm going to change on a runner because that does change a lot of different loading uh, or loading on a lot of different structures i've got that baseline value so already i've already got that done um you know i, I as far as views go I, I i tend to start from behind and i do a, like a full body view uh, then I drop down to the feet and do a, do a foot view from behind. Uh, and I make sure that I've got my camera to the level of the subject that I'm looking at. So if I'm, if I'm looking at the foot, I'm really interested in foot and ankle mechanics. That means I've got to have my camera like you know, level with that. Um, then from there, I'll go around to the right side or the left side and I'll do, I'll do the same thing like full body from the, from the right side. Then I'll drop down and take a look at their, right foot strike pattern and foot mechanics on from the sagittal view and then i'll go around to the other side and do the same thing um i keep it pretty quick i don't spend a lot of time uh with the person running on the treadmill i do give them about five minutes to kind of settle into their normal running mechanics because we know that uh, that's about as long as it takes to for most people to accommodate to the treadmill that you have in your clinic or in your lab uh, some people require a little bit more time. Um, I don't really do a lot of views from, from the front because it, it often doesn't really offer me a whole lot uh, either. Um, and then the other thing I do too is I only record each one of those views for about maybe five to maybe I'd, let's say 10 seconds total. And the reason is when they're running on a treadmill, your running pattern is, is um, it's fairly repeatable. The variability is very low. So if I get three or four good um, gait cycles in, that's going to be pretty representative of their normal running mechanics, um, whether I'm doing five, 10 seconds or 10 minutes. Yeah, perfect. And um, it segues nicely actually into a, a question that I had for you as well. 
because I know you've published a lot in this area on on the differences between treadmill running and, and ground running because we do know that we'll see a lot of people coming in who are who are not treadmill runners they're overground runners but for our convenience we get them on the treadmill um, yeah. and there's been so many papers over the years that have looked at metabolic cost and economy and and kinematics of the hip and and i think you from your uh, more recent publications looked at loads in in the ankle in there versus was it a load uh, loads proximally versus loads distally and um, could you give us a, a real uh, sort of summation of the big differences we should be aware of and, and cautious of when looking at someone on a treadmill and extrapolating them to being outdoors yeah so kinematically um which is joint angles, there's, there's very little difference. Um, the main differences when we run on a treadmill are from a spatial temporal standpoint, uh, runners tend to shorten up their step length by about 3%, and, uh, which is not much, which means their cadence goes up by 3% on the treadmill. So um, you know, the, the consequence of that would be twofold. One, if you see a runner over striding on the treadmill, and I guess I would, there are lots of different ways to kind of uh, from a qualitative standpoint, consider a runner that is overstriding. But, but typically, if that, that lower leg, their tibia, is really outstretched in front of them, that's a good sign that they're overstriding. If you see that person overstriding on the treadmill, you can be sure they're overstriding over ground because they've, they're going to, everybody, and it's very consistent, naturally shortens up their step, their step length on the treadmill. Um, and because they do that, as a natural consequence, they tend to land with um, a slightly flatter foot strike. So that doesn't mean someone's changing from a rear foot striker to a four foot striker when they are, you know, their rear foot striker over ground, suddenly they're a four foot striker on a treadmill. That, that's not the case. They just become maybe less of a rear foot striker on the treadmill. Um, other than that, um, you know, the knee, they land in a little bit more knee flexion on the treadmill, uh, but that's about it. They're really, from a joint angle standpoint, there really aren't any other major differences there. There are some differences when it comes to different uh, loads and how the loads are distributed. Uh, plantar flexor loads, we found plantar flexor loads were about 12% greater when you're running on the treadmill versus running over ground. Uh, knee loads, um, and this is something I hear a lot from other clinicians, is that there's this misperception that, that those are lower on the treadmill, and we found that they're not. We found that uh, patellofemoral joint contact forces are the same on the treadmill as running over ground. What we did find was that uh, hip uh, extensor forces were, were lower on the treadmill than over ground. Um, so it seems like that that load when you're running over ground, there seems to be more load up on your hip extensors. And when you run on a treadmill, it kind of, it basically, it just kind of shifts, it skips the knee and goes down to the plantar flexors. Um, so, but those are, those are muscle forces and you don't necessarily, you don't really see that. You don't see muscle forces when someone's, when you're doing a gait analysis. Um, so yeah, I think, I think clinicians can feel really confident doing gait analysis, um, on a treadmill and, and feeling good that that is, is, is a good representation of that runner's normal movement pattern, um, over ground. Actually, Rich, what, one thing I've just focused a little bit more on recently is the, I still look at cadence, but looking more at the touchdown angle of the foot where, you know, the, the dorsiflexion angle or whatever it is at touchdown, which is obviously related to cadence. Uh, especially in the context of anterior compartment syndrome yep. and those kinds of issues. And obviously it's related to overstriding as well. So, you know, overstriding cadence, well, is it really the, the that touchdown angle that's the, the issue? Yeah. I mean, when we look at, when we look at what contributes to, so let's say like high impact forces, uh, when a runner is, has high impact forces, what types of uh, kinematic patterns can contribute to that? Well, we know that, as you mentioned, like the, uh, a more dorsiflexed um, foot can contribute to that. Um, but we know also a runner that is um, landing with their knee more extended in their lower leg, um, yeah. more or less, less vertical. Those things seem to be very predictive and also how far that foot is landing in front of the center of mass. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, if you've got that foot laying really far in front of your center of mass, um, which it, it's, I mean, by the way, it's always going to land in front of your center of mass when you're running, but it's just with the overstrider, it lands even further, um, that, you know, what, what can happen then is that your like your loading rates, or your impact forces will, will go up. And as part of that, yeah, that touchdown angle, um, mm -hmm. will also, will also go up. So yeah, whatever I think qualitatively works for you clinically so that you can identify someone who has that kind of overstriding mechanic, mm -hmm. I think can be, can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we've come to that time where we need to talk about footwear. 
<laughs> well, actually, we're out of time, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, we, we, know, we know. We know. We know. We could have a whole podcast live episode on footwear, and in sh- and and we for sure we will. So don't feel pressured to uh, to really get stuck into it. But I also am fully aware that you, uh, in, of all the papers you've published, you've, you've published a lot on this as well. The um, I've certainly seen papers of yours that have looked at kinetic and kinematic differences between your minimalist shoes and your traditional shoes. So without getting into a big barefoot minimalist running um, debate, and I don't think it would be a debate because I, I, I suspect all three of us are on a similar page. Um, could you give the listeners a bit of a uh, an overview of what your, not your opinion, but what your, your data, your research has sort of shown with regards to footwear and how it fits into this whole puzzle? Yeah, so what I'll do, I'll go ahead and kind of include other people's work in this discussion as well. Sure, um, sure. But when, we, when you look at a, a runner who's a standard shoe wearer, um, so just your typical, I don't know, Asics 2000 series or whatever, or Nike Pegasus or something like that. When they transition to a minimal shoe, there's some really interesting things that don't happen. And they don't seem to change their strike pattern. Uh, and it seems to be when you look across all the studies, there are a couple of studies that show that they tend to land with a slightly flatter foot strike because it, you know, so forth, but that's not been a consistent thing. We haven't found that. We find that they continue to be heel strikers. Uh, and as a result, because they're landing, there's less cushion between your heel, uh, your calcane, your very dense calcaneus on the ground, your loading rates, your impact forces go up in minimalist type shoes. Um, so, so as far as, you know, from that aspect, there's, there's that. And then when we look at other like very highly cushioned shoes, like a Hoka type shoe, the really interesting thing there too is that when you go that put that standard shoe wearer in that Hoka shoe, their impact forces also go up. So it's kind of like you mentioned that Goldilocks kind of keep me a principle earlier is like too little cushion you see greater impact forces too much cushion you see more impact forces um but i'd be a little bit cautious in like how that's being measured because people tend to what you're really measuring is the the interface between the sole of the shoe and the force plate not so much the sh- the foot and how much for how much force is being attenuated in that hoka in that midsole which can be very very if anybody's ever running it's like running on pillows um so that's from a loading standpoint and so forth. But so mechanics don't seem to automatically change just because you put a new shoe on. Um, and when we look at injury risks and so forth, it seems like when a runner goes to a maximal shoe, so if they're a standard shoe wearer and they go to a maximal shoe, it doesn't really seem to really dramatically change their injury risks, at least in the, the few preliminary studies that I've seen. Um, so, and that's probably because it's not really a big change. It's not really a huge change to go from like a, a like a Nike Pegasus to a Hoka. I mean, it, it, it does feel softer, but it's not a massive change. But what we do know is that when you go from a standard shoe to a minimal shoe, your injury risk does go up. And it seems to be elevated for at least six months uh, during that transition period. And, and I, if, I, if I remember correctly, I think that's the longest study that's been done is out to six months. And that's by, by, um, by Fuller. Uh, and they found that injury risks tend to be a little bit higher, particularly in your heavier runners and your lower mileage runners. Um, but I think let's be generous and let's say that minimal shoes don't seem to reduce injury risk. And let's also say that maximal shoes also do not reduce your injury risk. So probably the shoe that you're wearing probably has um, a minimal effect on an individual's uh, risk of sustaining a running related injury. But could, could that be subject specific? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 definitely. And, you know, there, and that's not saying I don't ask a runner to change their shoes. So, you know, I, I, I use this classic example a lot when I do talks on, on shoe wear. Uh, if I have a runner who has, uh, like I had a runner a couple years ago, had, she, she came to see me, she had a couple um, repeat fifth metatarsal stress fractures. And she was running in a shoe that had a big medial post and um so and ironically it was the nike pegasus which is marketed as a neutral running shoe but it, you know it had this big medial post so I, I took her out of that shoe and put her into a shoe that had a little bit less of a post mm-hmm. um the other thing of that the other side of that would be someone who's got um like a hallux rigidus or something like that that runner is not going to do well in a very flexible shoe i'm going to put them in a shoe mm-hmm. that maybe has a, a a stiffer sole so for instance maybe a um maybe a trail running shoe that has a, a polyethylene plate in it or something like that. Uh, that's going to kind of stiffen up the sole of the shoe mm. for sure. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 There's oh, definitely, there's, there's room. 
and therefore yeah, well, but the yeah, the way I try to explain it is the you know the the systematic injury rate and in minimalist versus maximum shoes appears to be the same, but within that there's going to be sort of subject specific risks that means they perhaps should be in one group or another group just generically and broadly um, because of that. I right. Think, um, you, oh, sorry, Rich. Okay. Go on. No, I was going to say, I think, I think you're probably just maybe, maybe choosing different injuries. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. I've always said the six, uh, that quote of mine that, you know, different running shoes and different running techniques load different tissues differently in different runners. That's true. <laughs> And that's, yeah, that's <laughs> um, when we when we're recommending shoes for set, like well, I, I sort of phrased it pathology specific prescribing. You've touched on it there, Rich. I think it's one of the easier things to do. So if someone's got a, a space occupying lesion in the forefoot, like a burst or neuroma, you get them into a much wider toe box shoe. If someone's got a posterior ankle impingement, then you want to get them into a shoe with a lower a, a lower drop. And yeah, 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 I think those things are. are pretty easy i think the challenge for me and i think for a lot of people is those those new runners those uninjured runners when they start saying what shoe reduces my injury risk and then when we feed it back into trying to work out what role this shoe may or may not have in their own load capacity balance um where, what's your take on this because i know some people that say the shoe is totally irrelevant and you may as well run in a welly or you, you everyone should start in minimalist shoes you have i know you're familiar with that um approach as well where you have other people that say well you know i, I don't necessarily think that that's appropriate where, where do you sit on that spectrum i think i think age probably matter or it probably matters too so someone who's a you know an adolescent or pre-adolescent i think they can get away with less shoe if they're beginning a, a running program but i think if you're an older individual your ability to change uh tissue qualities at that point are, are limited and i think those runners are going to do better with with more of a shoe and the new runner because just running alone starting to run is a is a big adaptation for them it's a big ask of their plantar flexors or whatever but then also put them into a shoe that is not providing um much cushioning or something like that i think is probably asking asking for for some trouble so um yeah, so I think the, the Malisu paper that came out last year that found that, you know, like um, uh, a motion control type shoe seem to be somewhat protective um, for, for people who uh, had, uh, I'm trying to remember how they, the, uh, I think they use arch height index. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lower arch height index, mm -hmm. I think. Um, you, you know, I think, I think that there may be something to that. You know, I think that those individuals, yeah, so I guess the, I know I'm kind of giving a very long answer, but what I would say is they don't necessarily have to go into a very, um, like a minimal shoe. I think that's maybe asking for trouble. I think it's being very dogmatic, if, if you will. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, right, Craig, anything else? That's no, I think, I think the, the hour has gone really quickly. So it um, be a good place to wind up on. So thanks so much for that, Richard and, and Ian. But for those, I've just, again, I've just noticed a whole lot of Australians come on late, come back in 10 minutes, the video will be there. Um, but before we finish, I just want to, especially if there's any students listening, I just want to share this with you. Um, this was posted yesterday on Facebook when interviewing a podiatrist. You follow in and Craig Wright. Yes, I love their work. You're in. So um, <laughs> you might want to add to your CVs that you uh, follow us. Um, it may or may not have actually helped someone get a job. <laughs> so again, thanks so much, Richard. We'll, we'll have this up on YouTube later today and it'll be a podcast later today as well. So. It's thanks, Rich. Thanks, mate. That's excellent. Hey, guys, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed it.